folks today. Thank you. Good evening. Um, well, I want to start here. When I was in my first year at med school, I started climbing with a girl um, who was a bit better than me. I, I like to think that maybe she was just a bit taller than me and had a bit more reach. But um, we used to go on trips together. And when we used to buy our food, she would really carefully read the labels of everything. And, and I thought, yeah, she's just got one of these mild food intolerances, um, you know, the ones we're making really fashionable nowadays. So, uh, but actually, it, it turns out that she'd spent 12 months wheelchair bound with ME, chronic fatigue, uh, unable to go to school at 16. Uh, she missed out a year of her studies. And this, she found out eventually, was just due to an intolerance to milk. So, fortunately, she did everything herself. She kind of went on the internet. She did all the research she could. And eventually, she found her cure. But had she just listened to her medical health providers, perhaps she would have never got better. Perhaps she would have become permanently disabled and become a burden on the state and she'd have never come climbing with me. But on the other hand, had she come to see one of you, you know, she could have been on the road to recovery within three, four weeks because you know what to look for. And so... Really, what was the problem here? It's the standard of care that we have in this country, the systems we have. So her doctors did all the tests and they couldn't find anything wrong. So the presumption is, well, maybe there isn't anything wrong. Maybe it's all in her head. So she was given antidepressants. She was given cognitive behavioral therapy and some graded exercise therapy. But all of these things missed the point. And Fortunately, she found her own cure. Now, what we need is a new standard of care, one that embraces the new biomedical testing techniques that we have, that embraces diet, lifestyle, nutrition, all the things that in functional medicine we know should be the first line. And I know it's going to be costly to try retraining healthcare staff, to try thinking about how we are going to implement these changes in practice. But there's so many cost savings available if we can help cure people with these very, very simple, cost-effective, very safe techniques that the impact of that, even if just a fraction of our patients could benefit from these techniques, would just be massive on a societal scale. So what I wanted to talk about was how hang on, I'm pressing wrong one. How can we go from where we are now to an integrative pathway, looking at how functional medicine or the approaches that we use in terms of diet and lifestyle could become the normal standard of care. And in this country, that really means in the NHS, unless the NHS crumbles around us in the next five years. Um, and so looking at ways in which we can use these techniques in the NHS has been something I'm really interested in. And, and really, we're pushing on an open door at the moment. You know, there, there is this impetus for change We've got a new evidence base. So the Cleveland Clinic and, and other providers are now giving us new evidence for the, the standard of care that we use in functional medicine. So for our skeptical colleagues who will say, well, this isn't going to work, we're getting more evidence. There's real increase in public awareness as well. So a doctor in the house in the UK has really made a big splash here. And people are really interested I work in a fairly deprived part of Manchester in the north of England. And um, I'm constantly amazed that people are really, really interested. They want to avoid the medication or they want to come off their medication. And they're really willing to change their lifestyle and their diet. Something that if you asked most NHS GPs, do you think your patient could cope with this? They'd say, no, not a chance, not in a million years. But it's happening. Um, and also... 
just this, this change in terms of what we're seeing on our supermarket shelves. There's more interest in kind of clean eating uh, and in terms of all the new recipe books that are coming out, we're really seeing a change in public perception. And finally, the way that we're treating chronic illness at the moment is just unsustainable in terms of cost. As more and more people get type 2 diabetes, we're just going to shell out on more and more drugs. And as everybody lives longer with more and more morbidity, it's just going to cost too much. There has to be a change. And I want to see that change and stay in the NHS because it could happen in our lifetime. It could happen quite soon. But if we, have, if we want these changes to happen, there really are some challenges for us. So um, some of you may not be familiar with uh, the National Health Service general practice, so I'll just talk a little bit about that. At the moment, um, general practice is free, um, so you can walk in and see a GP whenever you like, um, but typically you'll get about 10-minute consultation, sometimes less. So a GP will see 30 to 40 patients a day in a good practice, but in places where we've got under-doctoring, uh, we're hearing horror stories about them seeing 50 to 60 patients a day on a routine basis. Because our population is aging, we've got increased polypharmacy and we've got people with multiple morbidities. So you're trying to take a complex patient and deal with that in 10 minutes. Now, what we do have is the chance for patients to come back repeatedly. But because of the um, pressure on the budget, what's happening is that the small uh, provider practices are being put into big multi-doctor clinics. And so that every time a patient rebooks, they can see a completely different GP. So no one ever gets to know them. No one ever gets a real holistic feel of what it is that patient needs. And that, that, re that loss of continuity of care has really been shown to reduce doctor empathy with patients. One of the things that's most sad about the pressures in general practice at the moment is what I'm seeing in terms of GP stress and burnout, which uh, Dr. Singh was talking about. There, there really is a, a problem with people leaving the profession. And at the moment, uh, the health secretary is talking about Im importing another 500 GPs from Europe to try and tackle the problem. Um, a doctor who lacks compassion isn't <coughs> going to be able to adequately assess a patient or make uh, a, good, uh, a good diagnosis. And then finally, the, the last thing that is a challenge for us is that current medical training doesn't really involve anything about diet and lifestyle. And doctors in general are quite skeptical about people that say it's going to make a difference. Uh, and I think the, the problem is that big pharma has really made an impact on the way we do research and the way we're taught to think about illness. So as a doctor, you learn to identify the right pill for every ill. So um, if you want to learn functional medicine, the only way to do it really is to start off in private practice. So you need to learn. You can try little bits on your NHS patients, and that's quite nice. But if you want to get to grips with the big testing, if you want to learn about genomics and really get to, to know how it works when you can do a fully holistic um, prescription for a patient and work with someone over time, in this country, really, you have to go private. It's not really going to help just doing it in the NHS. But once you've learned to do that, you can't switch it off. Once you're a functional medicine practitioner, it's just the way that you think. So if you're going back into the NHS, how are you going to cope with that? Uh, I think there are three things that you really need to have to, to deal with it with confidence. The first is knowledge. So there are all these courses run by IFM. There's loads of podcasts. There's lots of reading. There are many, many books out there. Educate yourself. But the other thing is get some experience too. In private practice, it makes a big difference. Uh, not only are you going to have to explain this to your patients, but you need to be able to explain this to your colleagues. You can't do anything in NHS general practice without somebody looking over your shoulder. Um, and if people start querying what you do, you need to be able to show the evidence and back it up. 
anybody that's taking this leap from traditional medicine into functional medicine uh, is going against the flow. You need courage, but don't feel you need to do this on your own. Join the community, get support from them, talk to doctors that have transitioned before you. It makes a really big difference. And just really take heart that you're not just being a weird doctor. There are so many clinicians all around the world that believe in the same medicine that you do. And finally, and this is the problem for our profession as a whole, you need compassion. You need to be able to love that person that's in front of you, treat them as though they were a member of your family. If in your own life you're too stressed, you're trying to get 60 patients out the door, or you've got that massive pile of paperwork that you just need to get through the day so you can start, it's going to be a real challenge to do functional medicine. So sometimes sorting out maybe your own life and your own priorities is what you need to do to be able to practice effective functional medicine. But it doesn't need to be difficult. So one of the things I've found is that you're taking this incredibly intensive, holistic, time-consuming discipline of functional medicine and you need to put it into a 10-minute consultation. How do you do that? Now, I thought this was going to be impossible, but actually I found it very rewarding and, and actually easier than I thought it was going to be. <coughs> the first thing to do is to listen. You can build the timeline in your head, you've got the patient's notes, um, but really, really acknowledge what it is the patients come to you with, what are their concerns, and tell them you're looking for the cause of their problems. This is a real revelation to most patients. No one's ever tried to figure out why they might feel as they feel before now. And the second thing is the testing. You know, in functional medicine, we don't do anything until we've got a few tests and we know that somebody hasn't missed something obvious. But it's surprising how many patients um, in the NHS will go on to potentially dangerous medication without even having basic nutritional screening, thyroid screening. And what I tend to do is anybody with psychological, neurological, fatigue syndromes, um, gastrointestinal problems, they'll all get tested. Uh, and that way, I just find so many more uh, pathologies than my colleagues would do. And it's not that they're not there for other doctors, it's just they're not looking for them. And the last thing is, making sure that you've got really good access to patient education. So you've only got 10 minutes with this patient, and I often work as a locum, so I may never ever see this patient again. I want them to be able to walk out of the surgery with the tools to educate themselves and to help themselves in the future. So I use websites, uh, typically books. So there's, there's lots of uh, functional medicine practitioners who've written uh, really, really handy books that I, I can uh, basically prescribe to patients, uh, leaflets and handouts. Uh, and I find that that's one of the most effective ways of communicating and allowing patients to educate themselves. So I sat and had to think about what is it that I do most different from my colleagues now as a functional practitioner when I sit in the NHS office. Cardiovascular disease management. So yes, I will do the risk analysis and assessment. So you, you tell them how, many, how likely they are in the next 10 years to develop heart disease. I will discuss with them the advice on statins and uh, I will even prescribe statins if, if that's needed but I'll also discuss CoQ10 and the problems that are potentially arising from statin use. But most importantly, and what gets missed everywhere, is the key issues of lifestyle and dietary management in terms of uh, modifying risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, this, co this conversation with the patient has to be very, very tailored to where they are now. If they are a single mum, living on benefits, still smoking 20 a day, that's a very different conversation 
them with somebody who is reasonably affluent and is at a point where they want, they're willing to change their diet and maybe do some more exercise. If I'm going to instigate something like the modified Mediterranean diet, I will give them all the tools to be able to do that in a very simple, straightforward way, usually by emailing them a pack with all the information. Digestive disorders, uh, the next thing where I think my practice is quite different. So typically in the NHS, we'd be looking for uh, symptom modification, so something to reduce pain, help constipation, etc. Um, as we know, and as you'll know as uh, therapists yourselves, elimination diets make a really, really big difference to these patients. It's one of the very simple and straightforward things you can do. It doesn't always work. It depends, of course, what the underlying problem is. But you're going to have a massive success rate just with elimination diet. Now, it is controversial in terms of the NHS, but I think there's enough evidence, which you can then put in the notes, for you to justify uh, adding this advice. The next thing is B12 deficiency. I, I could talk for a long time about this, but basically I test a lot. I have a very low threshold for testing for B12 deficiency, and I find it very, very frequently because I'm testing in the right places. And then when I see it, I treat it. And I will treat it according to the NICE guidelines, which is use hydroxycobalamin injections, six, and then every two to three months, depending on the symptoms. But what I see very commonly is GPs seeing very low levels of B12 and just telling their patients to eat better. It doesn't help. It doesn't work. And I think it's just this lack of education and lack of understanding in terms of uh, general practice is that we're not taught about how important B12 is to the biochemistry of the entire body. So there are, there are some education, uh, there is some patient and, and doctor education to be had here, but if you can look, the guidelines will support you in this treatment. Finally, autoimmune disease. In terms of NHS management, it's very much about trying to manage the patient in primary care for as long as possible, so we don't have to um, refer on, which is costly by the way. So every time we have to refer a patient that's going to cost the GP some money and we haven't got any money, so we manage them badly for a bit with some symptom control and that doesn't work and then eventually we'll refer somebody to a specialist, either a rheumatologist or a dermatologist. But what potential we have here is to actually reverse some of these autoimmune conditions. We know that we can immunomodulate using diet and nutrition. Now, there is definitely evidence for this, but what I would say I tell my patients is, I developed arthritis when I was 14, and uh, it wasn't until I was about 30 that I decided uh, to, I would do a, an autoimmune paleo diet myself, and uh, my arthritis has completely vanished and is just due to gluten sensitivity. And that's a very powerful message to share with patients because if I can get better just from not eating gluten, which is fairly straightforward, then so perhaps could they. So you do have to be sensitive using functional medicine in the NHS. Uh, there, are, there are problems doing it. I thought I'd offer a few tips. The first thing is be really confident about your education and be confident about the advice that you offer. So tell your, co your colleagues, I'm a functional medicine practitioner, I've done all these courses, my advice is evidence-based. I don't want them to think that I am just experimenting on their patients. And secondly, there are budget constraints. Don't go doing every test under the sun without speaking to the person who holds the purse strings. So, on occasions where I can really see that somebody would benefit from maybe a methylmalonic acid testing. So I see a lady in her 50s maybe who clearly looks like she has B12 deficiency, but she's got normal B12 levels. She's about to disappear off to memory clinic, never to be seen again. But what if she does have B12 deficiency? Now, I can't live with myself knowing that that potentially is the cause. So then I have a conversation with the GP and with the lab saying, could we get methylmalonic acid? And it turns out, yeah, you can, you can. 
Uh, or, or you could just try giving them B12. Um, but I, would, I will always leave the ball in the court of the senior partner. And there are cases which I just have to leave, where I know I can't do anything else in an NHS setting. If the patient doesn't have any funding, then they can do their best with the advice I can give them, and it stops there. If they do have funds available, then I'll tell them about other functional practitioners in the area. So either nutritional therapist or perhaps a doctor that's local. I have to be very careful not to sell my own services. It's looked on very dimly by the GMC to sell your own services to an NHS patient. Just be aware of that. And I'm also very careful not to undermine the role of the person's own GP, bearing in mind I'm a locum, so I just tend to go into practices and then leave again. I want the patient to know that According to that doctor's own experience and training, they've done exactly the right thing. The fact I offer different advice is because I've been differently trained. The next thing, very, very interestingly, if you go back and read the guidelines, often they fit in with exactly the kind of treatment that we would use in functional medicine. The problem is that at a local level, because of funding constraints and because of misreading of the evidence, things get changed. And what's very useful is to go away and look at the primary sources of evidence and research. And if you're going to do something that looks slightly out of the norm, put that in the patient's notes. It's going to back you up, it's going to support you, and if you want to spend more money on a patient that perhaps wouldn't normally be done, you've got an evidence base for it. So unfortunately, it is more legwork for, the, for me as a, as a doctor, but I'm quite careful to protect myself, especially if I'm advising something like um, taking milk out of a baby's diet. Okay? There are the UK national milk allergy guidelines which tell you exactly when you can do it and they're so sensible they're designed for primary care clinicians to deal and diagnose milk allergy in children and in infants but so many doctors are not aware of it and, and i find even pediatricians will not use them appropriately when i think they would be of benefit so if you can be aware of those and flag them up in the notes then no harm can ever come back to you afterwards um, getting to know the local biochemist, again, you can get lots of testing that you wouldn't think you can, and of course they all have their place. So T3, I work in a, a place sometimes where you can't get a vitamin D level. Uh, somebody decided it wasn't a cost-effective thing to be able to do, so you can't order vitamin D. Um, <laughs> but, but normally it is available. T3 is available, you can get oxalate levels. So if you see somebody with the urinary problems, uh, interesting to know it's available on the NHS. Um, and ch when it, learning to talk to the biochemist to explain why you want it, they get really excited because someone is coming to talk to them about biochemistry, a doctor. And, uh, and they understand why it is that you might want a homocysteine or something like that. And they will often be really helpful. In fact, my local biochemist now Instead of bothering to take methylmalonic acid levels and freeze them and send them down to London, he basically talks the GPs into just giving the patients some B12 and seeing if that works instead. Um, and the final, final thing is, because you've got this constraint on time, so 10, I often lengthen my consultations a little bit to 15 minutes, um, make sure you've got easy to access resources in the clinic. It just makes things go a lot more smoothly. So... I don't know how this transition from our current model of care to a functional model, hopefully, is going to work out. I don't know if in the future my style of holistic medicine is going to be deemed unacceptable in an NHS setting. But I'm going to continue providing the standard of care that I know to be good and to the best of my ability. And I hope that at some point, hopefully not in the distant future, that will become the same standard that's available to everyone in the NHS. <laughs>